Well, good afternoon, basketball fans. We are broadcasting live from Wayne Prophet Court. Turner Gymnasium is the site, the University of Lynchburg, getting ready to take on the Salisbury University Seagulls. Kyle Haney hanging out with you for afternoon hoops. And my broadcast partner tonight is none other than the coach of the University of Lynchburg women's team. It's Allison Nichols. And, Coach, we're so glad to have you on. You're getting ready for your own game tonight, but you – decided to jump on the headset and enjoy some men's hoops here uh, in what should be a good matchup. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super excited uh, to see what's in store for us. And we get to preview your game a little bit as well, uh, taking on the Guilford Quakers. Uh, Just real quick, it's an ODAC matchup for you guys. I think the typical thought is you're a little more wired in, a little more focused. You turn up the intensity a little bit. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're really excited to start the new year. Obviously, to be at home is good. We've had a lot a lot of road games. Uh, so I think we're ready for a good test ahead of us with Guilford. The Salisbury University Seagulls are uh, on the end of a seven-game road trip. So we'll discuss that a little bit as the game goes on, and you can give us some insights there. But the starting lineup for the Lynchburg Hornets, it'll be number zero, Kuda Savage, the senior guard from Reston, Virginia. He'll be joined in the backcourt with number five, Landon Sutton from High Point, North Carolina. Next up from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, a senior swingman, Elijah Davis. Number 12, Trey Pittman from Wilson, North Carolina, out there as well. And it'll be number 13, Miles Taylor, joining him in the front court, the Jamestown, North Carolina native. Taylor and Pittman counted on to do a lot of the scoring for Lynchburg coach. Uh, Obviously, Elijah Davis, we've seen so much from him. And Kuda Savage is the really the the old man on that bunch. Even though he doesn't have a lot of starts under his belt, he's really the only guy coming into the season with a lot of experience. And Coach Hillary Scott has leaned on Savage to kind of be the general out there when he's on the court. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think he really sets the tone for the team. He's got awesome energy. He's a great on-ball defender, communicates well on the court. Um, So definitely brings a lot to the table. And you've got a similar situation with your ball club as far as youth. Now, you've got a lot more freshmen and some sophomores than Coach Scott, but that'll be another thing, a conversation piece for us as the day goes on. We've got a decent crowd in the gym here tonight, including most of the members of Coach Nichols, women's team, they'll be in action at 7 p.m. And I keep saying tonight, it's afternoon basketball, (laughs) Coach. i got to get used to that, but we'll figure it out as the day goes on. Tip goes to Salisbury, the Seagulls in their road burgundy uniforms with the gold and white trim here. Zone defensive, no, excuse me, it looks like it might be a man-to-man defense for Lynchburg to open up. We're 20 seconds into the ball game, first possession here. You're getting good energy from the crowd, and both benches are into it, a drive from Jordan Oates, and he steps on the baseline. That that first possession for any ball club, whether you're on offense or defense, is, is pretty key to try to set the tone there, isn't it, Coach? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great defensive possession for Lynchburg. I know they really want to key in on guarding those ball screens. Salisbury does a really good job in the pick and roll, and so I think that's a great start for the defensive unit for Lynchburg. Here's Elijah Davis trying to bounce it inside to number 12, Trey Pittman, and that skips out. Boo-boo on the starting lineup, fans. It's Pearson Young out there for Lynchburg, the freshman from Lynchburg. He's in there, not Kuda Savage, so it's Young. Young's actually making his eighth start in a row, which is pretty impressive for a true freshman. We'll get back to that in a moment. For Salisbury, number 11 is Greg Bloodsworth. He's a key. He's got the basketball right now. He's joined by Jordan Oates, Caden Mines, Buddha Spencer, and Brandon Craig. This is Spencer, right wing, slash and dash, off the window and down for two. Good individual play there by Spencer to see a little gap and exploit it, Coach Nichols. Yeah, I know with Salisbury, obviously they have a couple fifth-year guys that are pretty dynamic scorers, but they can certainly get some points from all five in the starting lineup. So you got to be really zeroed in and focused on on everybody out here. Triple on the way and in from Bloodsworth. There you see that danger man, 19.3 points per game for the fifth-year senior. He has hit a three-pointer in 13 of their games now, 13 of 14. Salisbury comes in at 7-6. and six. Lynchburg 4-8. and eight. We get our first foul of the game. That's on Buda Spencer. Comes with 18-20 left to play in first half action. Inbound coming up here from Landon Sutton. He'll press the start button. The official taking some time, and now we're set and ready to go. 
Yeah, I think that foul right there. I know Lynchburg wants to try to be really aggressive on some of the pick and roll action as well as Salisbury. So if they can continue to be aggressive and get some fouls, that's, that's a good look for them. Soft touch from Trey Pittman goes. Hornets needed that first basket of the game. They trail 5-2, came off a, a side out inbounds play. They wanted to get it to Sutton downstairs. They did initially, but he makes the extra pass to Pittman and it pays off. Now this is a zone defensive coverage from the Hornets. Buda Spencer floats one over the top and in for two, 7-2. Seagulls by five. Torpedo move inside by Landon Sutton. Good job to force the issue and catch the defender on the heels there. Should lead to free throws. With 17-14 left to play in the first half. Uh, how do you find that balance, Coach, as, as a guard when you see a defense maybe a little bit bent out of shape, out of sorts? How do you know when to attack the rim and when to get in the flow of your offense in kind of a secondary break like that? Well, I think the biggest thing with that is, you know, Landon did a great job of seeing the floor and kind of seeing Salisbury was was back but maybe not quite matched up and a little out of sorts. So he just kind of turned on the Jets and went to attack the basket. And, you know, he's already drawn two fouls on them. So you certainly like that aggressiveness from your point guard early on. That's when you, when you watch the games on TV, you hear the announcers talk about feel a lot. That, that's that feel, right, that basketball IQ piece. It's funny, we talk all the time about, you know, basketball is definitely a game where you got to play at different paces and different speeds. You can't just go 100 miles an hour all the time. And, again, you want someone like your point guard to, to be able to set that tone and know when to push it and when to pull it back out. Great penetration inside there. That was Cameron Hurd with slicing up the defense and then the pass inside for two, 9-4. Salisbury on top by five, Elijah Davis, left wing. He had a nice game Sunday in Lynchburg's loss to William Peace. Scored six points in, a, in like two minutes or something, coach, and Davis was really in the bag there. Couldn't continue it. What, what's, the, uh, what's the key for a player like Davis who can score from a lot of different areas? How do you stay consistent throughout the game but also not force it on the same time? Well, yeah, I mean, I think with Elijah, he's shooting the ball so well from three. I think he's over 40-some percent on the year yeah. from the three-point line. Uh, so you definitely want to get him some open looks from there, but also make sure he's not just settling for those threes and, and looking to score in, in multiple ways. Brandon Craig kicks it out, finds Mine waiting at the right wing. Mines, excuse me, that's no good. Lynchburg has to fight for a volleyball-style rebound. They come away with it. Here goes Sutton again. That time it was more of a circus layup that he had to go to and probably would like to have that one back, but Lynchburg will get it back. Good scramble there to play defense and cause the turnover. Sub in the game is Brendan Davis for Salisbury. We've got 16-28 left to play in the first. It's Seagulls 9, Hornets 4. I'm Kyle. My partner today is Allison Nichols, and we, uh, we've really got to talk about your game some, Coach, but we'll let, we'll let the plot unfold for this one some here. I know you're excited to get your team back in action, back-to-back -back home games for you here to start the new year. Sutton will work around the high ball screen. Now it's over to Taylor. Taylor's got Davis back to Taylor. He'll pull up from just outside the painted area. No good. Pearson Young's going to get whistled for the foul. Should be his first. Yeah, Lynchburg's first as a team. Number 33, Pearson Young. And uh, he is a VES grad, but has the Brookville connections like you do, Coach. His father was coach for about a decade there on the guys' team at Brookville. His sister was a very good Division I player. A lot to like about Pearson Young. Yeah, definitely. Actually, a fun fact with Pearson, his mom actually coached me mm. at Brookville in high school basketball. Uh, she was our assistant coach for varsity one year that I played, so I've known his parents for a long, long time. And, yeah, his sister Hannah is actually in her fifth year um, at Kent State, and she's had a great career up there. Impressive stuff. He's one of those guys that you call a gym rat, and then I think some fans, if they don't really watch a lot of basketball, they might think that's a, a derogatory term, but it's not. If you get called a gym rat, it's, it's really a high compliment. Salisbury basketball with the five-point lead. Here's Jordan Oates, the big man, comfortable outside the three-point ring. Nice ball movement there. Pocket pass inside to number zero, Brandon Craig. You're seeing how well Salisbury can operate offensively, Coach. They, they seem to have multiple ways they can break you down. There's a nice sky to the basket from Miles Taylor. Lynchburg needed that. 
Yeah, gives Lynchburg points five and six of the afternoon. Definitely a good sign for Lynchburg to get some quick, easy buckets. So now you just want to see him dig in a little bit on defense and yeah, not, not give up stuff so easy on that end. But I think offensively, you like what you're seeing so far. Hurd shoots it over Davis for two more. Now here's Elijah Davis. We'll try to answer from beyond the arc. No good. Coach Hillary Scott up on his feet, shouting some instructions from the bench. Here comes a pull-up jumper from Bloodsworth. That skips off, so one and done that possession. Small victory for the Hornets. Let's see if they can take advantage, get a basket of their own. Pulling up on the break goes Pittman. That's also no good. 14-45 left to play in the first half, 13-6. Both teams playing that up-tempo game, shooting it pretty quickly in the shot clock. I don't think we've really seen anybody get under 10 seconds in the clock yet, Coach. Yeah, definitely a, a pretty fast-paced game here. Um, you know, the tempo, tempo is upbeat, and both teams are really looking to be aggressive and attack. That's been a, a theme for Coach Hillary Scott all season. They wanted to play faster. Uh, at times, they have had to slow it down, get away from their full-court pressure that they were trying. That's got to be one of the tougher things as a coach, doesn't it, when you when you have a point of emphasis going into the season or even going into the game with a game plan, knowing when to get away from it and when to say, no, we, we need to stick with this. I mean, that's those are tough decisions, aren't they? Definitely, and you know, I think our team's actually going through a little bit of that too. We want to play at, at an upbeat tempo, but, you know, just – having our group of freshmen learn you know the time and score a little bit and, and when to maybe take advantage of a mismatch and call a set um you know we're, we're just continuing to learn and grow in that avenue and i think coach scott is, is having a little bit of the same with his team you know you just can't be 100 miles an hour all the time you got to pick and choose your battles a little bit there kuda savage is in the game for lynchburg now he'll work the high post pick and roll game briefly now it's elijah davis one dribble, cross court, back to Savage, who had his season high coming off the bench on Sunday with a dozen. Nice turnaround jumper there from Pittman. That looked good, and here's a timeout on the court for the Lynchburg Hornets. They trail 15 to eight, with 14-11 left to play in the first half. We'll step aside for a breath on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. Timeout comes with 14-11 left to play in the first half. Lynchburg got a nice basket. What, uh, what do you think was some of the conversation there in the huddle with Coach Hillary Scott and his assistant coaches? I would definitely say, I mean, that last offensive possession, getting it there, nice, easy post entry into Pittman. Um, I mean, he's so under control in the post. I would definitely think that's got to be a point of emphasis here moving forward. And there's a spark taking the charge. That'll get Lynchburg the basketball back. The foul is on number five, Brendan Davis. And we get the media timeout. So let's just keep it right here. Kyle Haney hanging out up top with head coach Allison Nichols of the Lynchburg women's team. Uh, let's get into the preview a little bit tonight, coach. We haven't touched on Guilford. What are they going to bring to the table? What, what scares you and what matchups do you like? Well, honestly, we, we match up pretty well with them. Uh, we are battling a couple of injuries, so we're down a little bit, which, which is unfortunate because I do think, like I said, we do match up really well with them. The biggest thing with them, they have two fifth years, uh, one of which is, is by far one of the best players in the league, Lindsey Galden. So, you know, she's averaging 15, 16 points a game. She could, she could put up 24, 25 on any given night, and she does a little bit of everything. She can rebound. She's a good passer. Uh, so we've definitely, we have to make sure that, that we control her. She does a great job of getting to the free throw line. Got to keep her off the free throw line. 
But I think for us, um, again, they don't have a ton of size. I think we need to make sure we're taking advantage of some post entries. You know, we shoot the three well at times, but we've got to make sure we're not just settling for those threes. I think our, our highest percentages with those are when we can get the ball inside out, whether it's a post entry or a drive and kick. So we've been focused a lot on that lately. Continuing to turn the tempo up a little bit defensively. I think you've started to see our pace pick up a little bit and our ability to, to turn other teams over has gotten a lot better. So we need to need to have some of that today as well. Well, I got a I got a really compliment a player that I loved watching the other day, Maddie Nimmo. Gosh, she was uh, outstanding and, and for freshmen she seems to have great feel out there, knowing when to attack the defense, when to pull it out, run the offense and a defensive spark as well. She's fun to watch. Yes, she really is, and she just, you know, brings a whole nother gear to our team. And, you know, we have so many freshmen. They're all learning each other and growing with every game. And, and I think, you know, especially with someone like Maddie, she's continuing to learn her teammates and doing a great job of putting them in position to be successful. Macy Mullins was the other one that I think maybe uh, fans – had to, had to catch the fans' eyeballs popping a little bit when she was five for five from beyond the arc. I mean, that's a that's a deadly weapon out there when she gets open, right? Absolutely. I mean, this her second career college game, she knocked down six threes at William Peace. You know, early in the year, Maddie was injured, so Macy had to have the ball in her hands a lot. Now we're able to play her off the ball a little bit, and that's really opened up her scoring. Nice scoop-style layup there from Greg Bloodsworth. He is the leading scorer for Salisbury, and with moves like that, you can see why scoring from a tough angle. Lynchburg basketball, they cut the lead down to five there, got a nice spark after that well-placed timeout from Coach Hillary Scott. Post action here from Trey Pittman, looking around, uh, looked like he wanted to pass it, Coach, but finally decides to let it fly and knocks it down. Again, I would go to that all day long. I mean, he was under such good control. That little fadeaway is tough to guard. Especially right now, I mean, Salisbury doesn't have a ton of size out there. Um, get those easy looks, and then, again, that, that opens up some of your threes and s some of your other things offensively. Here comes a timeout from Salisbury now. Their head coach, Maurice Williams, in his fourth season will call it. We've got 12-31 left to play here in the first half. Lynchburg trailing Salisbury 17-12. We'll step aside for a brief timeout on LHSN. Trey Pittman has six points to lead the Lynchburg Hornets. Charles, Salisbury shooting it well from the field, seven of nine so far. They've got eight from Brendan Craig. And right now the Seagulls lead by five. There's Buddha Spencer did not get it off before the shot clock expired. And we said both teams have been shooting early, Coach. Well, there's a time where Lynchburg with some great defense late in the clock. There was the timeout in there, but the Hornets – Nice job holding their ground there on the defensive side. Yeah, I think a great call by Coach Scott there out of the timeout. He actually came out in a 1-3-1, one, one, and I think that took Salisbury a little bit, um, had him a little bit out of sorts, you know, whatever they, they drew up in the timeout. I don't think they drew it up for a 1-3-1, one, one, so um, great play call there. Defensive call there by Coach Scott. Hornets down by 5, 12-17 left to play here in half number one. The officials are at the scorer's table for – a short conversation it looks like and it gives us more time to talk to the the real dynamic member of the dynamic duo today coach Allison Nichols uh, what what else about your team are you liking so far coach it's a young group uh, I want to get into how how you find some of these outstanding players because you've got a team really from from all over not just the state of Virginia but you're you're going far and wide to bring in this talent yeah, you know, recruiting is a unique thing, and I think one thing that you run into in this league is, you know, you're recruiting against ODAC competitors often if you stick to certain areas. I've been doing this a long time, so certainly I know, 
you know, have some connections in the state and, and whatnot, but, you know, we spend, our coaching staff spends a lot of time over the summer on the road at tournaments. Um, and, and really, you know, if I see players that I think fit our system and fit our culture and, um, you know, stack up academically, then no stone left unturned. You know, if they're interested in Lynchburg, we try to get them to campus and, and just go from there. And one of the tough things has got to be uh, balancing how good they are at the moment in high school, but then also the, the potential piece there, right? Because there's late bloomers, there's people that, hey, maybe they have size, but they don't have skill yet or vice versa. All those things are probably factors too, right? And there's such a huge transition from high school to college basketball. And, and yes, everybody is the best player on their high school team and the leading scorer and all of those things. And then you get here and, and you know, you, you gotta figure it out. And, and that's, again, with our team being so young, everyone's kind of learning and growing together, which is a positive, but there's also a huge learning curve. So, you know, we've definitely dealt with a good bit of that through the first couple months, but I think you can see our freshmen are really starting to settle in and, and, and figure out, you know, basketball at this level and what it's all about. A drive from Parham doesn't go, but he was fouled. Official signals it's going to be on the floor. So Lynchburg will inbound baseline right, trailing by seven, 19-12. 11 left to play. Bloodsworth got another basket while we were talking. He is the leading scorer for Salisbury, fifth-year senior. On the court right now for Lynchburg, it's number one, Jordan Parham. Zero, Kuda Savage. They toss it into number four, Alex Fitch. Number three, Kavon James out there. And then you still have number 13, Miles Taylor, the only starter on the court right now. At the moment, Lynchburg has been searching for those right combinations all season, Coach. You, you find five that work well together, but you can't just use them all game. And then the substitution pattern is, is always kind of a revolving door, a moving target uh, for all teams. Here's a nice turnover steal that Miles Taylor will get. Run the break himself for a moment. Now it's off to Fitch. Fitch, free throw line, cut off, back to Taylor. Gets around a defender, ooh, and the pass is off target. But just finishing the thought there, you want to try those different combinations and, and, and see who plays well together, and you'd like to get those five that ideally, you know, can operate for, for a good percentage of the game. But that's so hard to do, and, and it's trial by fire, too, because you're playing games while you're trying to do the experiments, right? Well, and there's all, always undetermined factors. You know, I think Pearson Young has got two fouls. Yeah. So, you know, depending on what you, you choose to do as a coach, but that could take you a little bit out of rotations or, or you know, whatever your game plan initially was. And sometimes it just depends on, you know, the, what the other team brings to the table. You know, do you need a little bit more size some games? Do you need a little bit more speed some games? Do you need outside shooting? So, it, you know, it's at least nice to have lots of options in your bag to go to. The three ball went in for the Hornets. Watch out for Buda Spencer. Got it to the front of the rim but couldn't score. Scramble for it. Great effort. Down on the floor, Spencer will somehow come out of there with the ball, and he beat the defense. That's a tough defensive possession for Lynchburg because you're diving after the basketball, and all of a sudden the player gets free and the ball pops to him. Hats off to Salisbury for great effort on their end as well. They now lead by nine, biggest advantage of the afternoon. Ooh, Fitch got up in the air and wanted to shoot, instead passed it. Here comes another triple on the way. Jordan Parham, this one was from NBA range. He had seven off the bench Sunday. He's already got six after back-to-back -back threes. Spencer with more, the finger roll finish. Definitely some contact. And there's the back and forth basketball. Lynchburg with a big swing. The three was a momentum. And then all of a sudden, you give it right back. A quick bucket from Salisbury. Yeah, kind of how the game started a little bit. Uh, both teams trading baskets there. Uh, you know, I think with Parham, obviously, he brings that ability to, to shoot the three, uh, especially from long range. Oh. And then there, there's back to back threes right there. Right on cue. Talk about long range again. College line not necessary. That one was from NBA land there for Alex Fitch and Lynchburg heating up from long distance. We get another timeout with 8.49 left to play in the first half. It's now a five point Lynchburg deficit. We'll keep it right here again and just continue the thought. You start getting guys hot, coach. Then it becomes more basketball IQ to know hey, who needs another look? Who's got the hot hand? Try to find it to them. And then that player's got some responsibility to not try to force it, but still keep it within the rhythm of the offense. 
Definitely. I mean, I think, obviously, the, the three-pointer brings such a different dynamic to games. I mean, back-to-back -back threes right there, and you close the gap to five. But what you don't want to do is, is, like you said, you don't want to start forcing them or just settle for threes because they have had some success attacking the basket, you know, getting some fouls called when Pittman's in there, and I think he just subbed back in right there. So, you know, getting continuing to get him some post touches to make sure that you're getting some easy looks around the rim as well. And how much of that is coachable, in your opinion, or is it is it mostly you just got to play and you just got to get more reps under your belt? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I think as a coach, especially out of a timeout, you know, you can talk them through a little bit what you want the next couple possessions to look like, but some of that is feel as well. You know, they may take away the three and the inside's open or vice versa. So you just got to let, let them play it out a little bit there as well. Inside was open for Buddha Spencer again, or excuse me, Brandon Craig. It's no good, but Jordan Oates got the rebound and the stick back for the deuce for Salisbury. 28, 21, Seagulls up the lead back to seven. Lynchburg has trailed the entire afternoon. Parham wants another one and lets it fly, but we're gonna get a foul on the screen there. Fitch with a short conversation with the official, trying to figure out exactly what the man in the striped shirt saw, but it's yeah, going to go when, against Lynchburg. Go ahead. When you set screens kind of out in the open like that, the all eyes are on you from an officiating standpoint. So you've really got to make sure you stay within your plane. You know, any leaning, any, you know, throwing an elbow out or anything like that. That's exactly what they're looking for. So you've got to be really careful with some of those screens. It feels like that's one that's become a, a, a greater emphasis for officials over the years as well. Uh, keeping a closer eye on those screens. Watch out for Savage. Nice job to turn the corner and get to the rim. We saw a bunch of that this weekend. He can do that. Lynchburg needs that from him. And they're now down five again. The three ball up. No good. Seagulls get another chance. Brandon Craig to the rim. Scores it. They have been very good in the painted area, Coach. When, when Salisbury gets it in the lane, more often than not, they score. When they don't score, they seem to be sending more and more guys there for the offensive rebound to get another try. Here's Savage, great ball fake and the extra pass. Impressive there. That's the field that we were talking about. He just scored one, so you might think he wanted to do it again. Head fake, extra pass, and then it becomes an easy two from his teammate. Yeah, I mean, uh, just a great job of getting downhill and, and again, attacking that paint area. Anytime you can get paint touches, whether it's off of a drive or post entry pass, that just opens up so much more of your offense. You get some easy baskets and then you get a little bit of momentum offensively. Here's Brandon Craig, wants to get to one of his scoring spots. It's right there, yeah, the fadeaway from the lane, 10 feet, no problem for number zero, Brandon Craig. He's got three double doubles on the season and he's headed towards another one here. Craig with a nice opening frame for Salisbury and there's more nice stuff from Kuda Savage. Agent Zero getting two more points for Lynchburg. They pull within five again. It's a full one minute timeout, so we'll take a little break here with 6.46 left to play in the first half. It's Salisbury 32, Lynchburg 27 on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. The Salisbury University Seagulls in town to take on the Lynchburg Hornets. It's the end of a seven-game road trip. I uh, 
just contacted their coach, Maurice Williams, Mo Williams in his fourth season. He he didn't seem to mind the long road trip very much. I said, you got to be itching to get back at home and play in front of the home fans. And he kind of gave me the, uh, the cliche coach speak. Well, winning on the road is part of being a good team. Uh, but I got the impression it was genuine. I don't think he said it to be cliche. So good, good, uh, good stuff there. And Greg Bloodsworth with a good basket right out of the timeout. I mean, is that one of the keys to those long road trips, Coach, is just try to embrace it, try to turn it into a positive, I guess? Definitely. I, I will say, you know, Salisbury's now in that kind of unique, that coast-to-coast -coast conference. Yeah. So I think every team in that conference spends a lot of time on the road. So I, I guess they're just kind of getting used to it. And, you know, when you do get to play at home, it's almost like an added bonus. Basketball out of bounds. Good recovery by the Lynchburg defense. But Brandon Craig got behind everybody again. Here's Pearson Young back in the ball game for Lynchburg. Yeah, the coast-to-coast the, the -coast -coast conference is fascinating. Fans should, should look that up and research more. It's the old Capital Athletic Conference, and they've reformed with some other teams. And uh, it's a pretty unique deal for sure that maybe, maybe we'll have more time to talk about. But this game on the court has definitely got our attention. There's number 33, Jordan Oates. The big man with the with the linebacker tight end frame getting to the basket there, and now he'll shoot two for Salisbury. 5.57 left to play in the half, 34-27. Lynchburg was kind of in one of those danger zones there, Coach, where they went down nine, but it never got to double figures, and you got to feel good about that as a coach. Is this another one of those those key moments here, under, under six, under five minutes to play in a half, where you really, really want to try to lock down and have a laser focus? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think you, you don't want this gap to get any bigger going into halftime, but you still have plenty of time. you got six minutes, so, you know, you don't need to come down and take quick threes or anything like that. You know, just keep attacking and doing what you've done offensively to get some easy baskets. Davis threw it away. He thought Pearson Young was going to cut right, and he cut left, and it's unfortunate for Lynchburg. It's one of those you see even in the NBA occasionally. A basketball just ends up in the second or third row because – a man goes one way instead of the other, but now the Hornets are going to have to defend again to defend again and hopefully keep this to a single-digit deficit. There's Caden Mines, kind of quiet for Salisbury so far. This man not quiet. That's Greg Bloodsworth knocking down another one. Pretty impressive. He has 11 now for Salisbury, and the lead is up to a dozen. Biggest advantage of the afternoon so far for the Seagulls. Davis steps into a three. That's wide right. Rebound loose. Pearson Young has it. It's a foul going against him. No, it's going against Caden Mines. Good position there. Nice job by Pearson Young to get some space and get that rebound. It'll be on the floor, of course. Lynchburg will inbound here. You guys had some interesting baseline inbounds plays, Coach. I know that's kind of a that's kind of a lab for most coaches where they really like to score and you can have some fun with the creativity drawing them up and right on cue, Lynchburg does get a basket out of it. Absolutely. You know, I think early in the year with our young team, we had so many different things to focus on and teach. You know, we didn't have a lot of time to hone in on that. And since we've been back from Christmas, we've, we've spent a lot more time in that area. Just, a, you know, a little bit of a little bit of time each practice. And, and I think, you know, it really paid off this past Saturday. And, and hopefully we can continue on with that a little bit. Nice job by Kudu Savage to get the feet set, take the charge. That might keep Salisbury away from the basket a little bit. That's the second charge that Lynchburg has drawn. I think the charges, this is a big pet peeve of mine, Coach. Charges need to be a bigger statistic because when you draw a charge, your team automatically gets the ball back. With a block, a block is great. A block shot is great. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes the offense still gets to keep possession. A charge is a, is a higher value play. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's kind of a momentum play as well. You know, it hypes up your team. It gets you excited. And it's a turnover. You know, you're, you're causing a turnover for the other team. And you're putting, you know, whichever one of their players, you're adding a foul to their statistics. And you get the ball back. Yep. Another three by Lynchburg. That's momentum. Hornets need that here as the half is getting late. Another good defensive possession for Lynchburg as well. Here comes the drive from Craig. Kicks it down in the corner. Three ball up. No good. Ball is loose. Hornets are going to run it down. Watch out for Savage. Head of speed. Whistles one to Parham. Fakes the three. Now pulls it. Oh, that would have been so big if it went in. Ball is still loose. Davis going to get after it there. He ends up in the front row. Great effort from Elijah Davis. He's a little bit slow to get up. I think he's okay. 
based on the last. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I was, he stayed down for a while, Coach, and then when everybody in those first two or three rows down there in front of him started laughing, I, I came to realize he's fine. He's down there making jokes and having the comedy hour, so you like to see that. You like to see the effort as well. Yep, definitely love the hustle on that. And, uh, again, big, big defensive stand here for Lynchburg. You know, they had a great possession, forced a contested three that last one late in the shot clock. and Might get it back right here, right scramble. There. Davis on the ground again, spending more time getting the jersey dirty than uh, on his feet. Impressive stuff, and the possession arrow will favor Lynchburg. Nice job by Elijah Davis. Got to love the effort. Lynchburg ball down 7, 347 left to play in the half. Pittman's got 10, Savage 7, Parham 6. So Savage and Parham there, 13 combined off the bench. Taylor with 4, Fitch 3. Lynchburg had 12 players score on Sunday, Coach. You guys had a similar situation there with a lot of people scoring, and we've talked about that just with these young teams. You're trying to find the combinations. You want people to get reps. And, and it is nice when you have multiple people that can score. There's something to be said for having that 1A and 1B. Savage will pull the trigger off the double screen. No good. But there's Davis doing the dirty work again. Extra chance here for the Hornets. Savage, fade away, window. Nope. And it's going to be an offensive foul on somebody for Lynchburg, either Pearson Young or Trey Pittman. It's on Pittman, just his first. 3.29 left to play in the half. Uh, you and I spoke briefly about that, though, but uh, you know, as far as a the balance there between having multiple people that can score and then having a couple defined scores where you can say, go get a bucket, let's run a play for so-and-so, that kind of thing. Uh, talk about uh, pros and cons from each way. Yeah, I think, again, I think Coach Scott and, and their team are similar to ours where, you know, we've got 10, 11 people that we can, we feel comfortable putting in the game and, and that can score for you. But on the flip side, neither one of us really have that, you know, 15, 20 point a game. I, I know that's what you're going to give me on a consistent basis. So it can be plus and minus, you know, when you're struggling to score, sometimes you got to figure out who's going to give us points. But then, you know, as far as the other team, they, they don't necessarily know who they're going to hone in on or zero in on and try to stop. Good sequence of basketball there. Defensively, both teams really walling up nicely around the rim. Lynchburg will have to try to do it again here. There's a foul right wing, 20 feet away from the basket. Elijah Davis just kind of got the thigh into the body. Hillary Scott questioning the call, but it will send... Salisbury to the free throw line. That's number one, Cameron Hurd. Team foul number seven. I, I just think, you know, it's interesting because all players want to play. And, and it's nice when you know you're going to be out there for a five or a six or a seven minute stretch where you can really kind of get your sea legs and get comfortable. And then that chemistry with the other players that you're out there with. But the other side of that coin is it, the game is too fast paced these days to play all five the entire time. That's just really unheard of nowadays absolutely yeah i mean you know 25 game season you're playing two three games in a week yeah you want to keep everybody fresh but also you know keep keep a lot of your team engaged and and that's where you know having a, a little bit of a bigger rotation everybody brings a different dynamic so it's harder for teams to scout you and prepare because you can throw a lot of different weapons at them Pull up Jay from Pittman, trying to dot the eye. Pearson Young's got another rebound. He's been doing some nice work on the glass. Watch out. Big swat there from Brandon Craig, but it's still Lynchburg basketball. Young lets it fly from three. No good. Elijah Davis, he'll get another chance. Leans in, right shoulder, powers through it, and he'll headbutt the padding there. Elijah Davis feeling it. He's been looking for a basket all game, Coach. He's been doing all the hard work, all the intangibles, everything you want. It's about time he got himself a bucket, deserved that, and Lynchburg needed it. Yeah, you definitely love the effort down there. I mean, you know, multiple offensive rebounds in that possession to, again, keep this, you know, keep this game in check. You make sure that Salisbury's not getting out to that double-digit lead. Get yourself two points into the free throw line. And like you said, see the ball go in the basket, and sometimes that's all you need to open up your offense, open up your outside shooting a little bit. Davis cans the free throw. Kuda Savage back in. He'll take the place of Landon Sutton. Some token full court pressure here. Looks like full court man to man right now for Lynchburg. So we've seen some zone of, of the 2 3 and the 1 3 1 variety. 
And now it looks like a man-to-man -man coverage. They'll switch there as number five, Brendan Davis, runs everybody through, trying to go to the low post entry. He'll cross over. He's got a matchup small on big there, jumps across the baseline, good athletic play. This is a nice possession for Salisbury until they lost it. The ball was all over the court there, Coach, so you got to like how Lynchburg defended, especially Pittman got caught really with a matchup that wasn't great for him, but he was able to stand his ground there, and Lynchburg gets a turnover. Yeah, definitely not a ton of size out here on the floor for Salisbury. Um, so for the most part, you know, good matchups for Lynchburg as far as man-to-man, as -man, and that was a great defensive stand right there. Parham looking for another from long distance. It skips out. Pittman was in the area, but basketball off his left hand. We've got 120 left to play in the half, 41-35. Lynchburg trailing. It's been a Salisbury lead all game, but Lynchburg never really out of it. They fell down 12 at one point. That was the biggest deficit so far in the afternoon. Number five, Brendan Davis working against Savage. Savage will try to get around the screen. There's the switch again. I don't know if it's a true switch or they're trying to hedge coach and just kind of getting caught out of it, but Salisbury will get a basket there from Buddha Spencer. Yeah, like I said earlier, I know Lynchburg has definitely keyed in a little bit on how they were going to guard that pick and roll. I think they're just trying to give them some different looks and keep them off balance. Might be a little personnel based too, as far as, you know, helping on some and, and switching on others, just depending on who's in the pick and roll. Spencer can't finish inside. He'd love to have that one back. He's usually pinpoint from that range there, but it now back to the defensive end for Lynchburg. There's some contact. This is going to be a foul against Jordan Parham. Stops the clock with 29.1 seconds left to play in the half. That's his first. Should be Lynchburg's number eight foul, and it will send number five, Brendan Davis, to the free throw line, a six-foot sophomore from Annapolis, Maryland. He is the team leader in steals. You can see why he's quick, left-handed shooter, getting ready to try to put Salisbury up by nine, and he does just that. Shot clock will be off for Lynchburg when they get the basketball. If they get the basketball here, I guess you can't assume it's a made free throw, but Davis looked pretty good on that stroke. He comes into the game shooting 79% from the charity line. Second one's up and also good. The lead is now 10 for Salisbury, and they'll take a quick timeout. We'll keep it right here because we're getting ready for the halftime break. You talked about how Lynchburg was going to play the screens. There was some question there. Uh, I think you got a predominant way that you try to play those ball screens, whether it's a, a, a hedge or a get over the top, go underneath. Uh, I guess the other the other option is to switch them all. But uh, what do you what do you guys like to do defensively? And then do you have to have the other options in there just in case you want to switch it up from time to time? Yeah. So right now, this year, our our I guess main defense against ball screens is we call it red, but we trap them. Um, you know, we don't have a ton of size. We're not super worried about a lot of mismatches. We want to generate some steals. So um, we actually haven't run into a, a big ball screening team yet. But, um, you know, we try to trap those and get over the top. But there's a lot of different ways to play them. I think it depends on who you're playing a little bit too. Obviously, we played a good bit of zone or all zone against North Carolina Wesleyan because they're not a great three-point shooting team, but they're super athletic. Um, so, you know, with some teams like that, you may not want to jump out and trap because they, they may be able to turn the corner and, um, you know, have a have a five on three or something like that. But I think teams that have some people that don't handle the ball that well, if you can keep the pressure on off of some of those, you know, those ball screens, then that takes them a lot out of a little bit of the flow and rhythm of their offense. Well, it's fascinating to, to talk about and to watch what different teams do. And I, I think it's great insight by you into how coaches think because this is – I mean, these, that conversation right there, that's one that you're having with coaches when you're breaking down a team's uh, tendencies. And I'm sure sometimes you're going to bed at night wondering, why am I thinking about how we're going to play ball screens instead of going to bed here? But uh, that's the life of a coach, yeah? Absolutely. I, I think uh, that's as soon as basketball season starts, that is I go to bed thinking about it and I wake up thinking about it. And, and again, you go through all scenarios, you know, you replay a game in your head and you're like, yeah, yeah if all that one position <laughs> had done this or if I had changed defense that one time. Yeah. So that's that's just uh, the life of a coach. Down to six seconds in the half. Savage at the joystick, kicks it out to Pittman for three. It's no good, but the foul comes with 1.8 seconds left to play in the half. So Trey Pittman's going to get three free throws here for Lynchburg. That's 
the kind of the proverbial bail out there from Salisbury, a really good defensive stand, and then you commit the foul as Pittman's coming down, but still in the act of shooting. So he's got three. Lynchburg trails by 10. Right-handed shooter makes the first. I want to talk about your wonderful coaching staff here at halftime because I know you're really proud of them and everything you're getting from, uh, from those two wonderful assistants. We'll get to that here in a bit, and we'll have plenty to discuss about this game and what the adjustments might be second half for each ball club. It's been a good one so far. I, I hate to be cliche and say it feels closer than nine, but it, it really does. It's an eight-point deficit now, but it, it feels almost like a tie game, Coach. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's been a game of runs, obviously. Both teams have had their their moments. Um, you know, Lynchburg has been able to keep it close and not let that lead get extended. And, again, I think this could be huge right here. You had a chance to go. You know, Salisbury had a chance to go into halftime up 10. You foul a three-point shooter, and now it's seven. Um, you know, so great job by Pittman of putting in those – those free throws and and keeping this game close. Pittman makes three. It's now 45-38. Salisbury with the seven-point advantage. We've reached halftime here at Turner Gymnasium. Afternoon hoops on Lakeside Drive. We're so glad you are hanging out with us on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. Every great college has a great city. For Lynchburg, we are near urban areas with lots of restaurants, shopping, and events. Plus, we are one of the top schools in the area. Come see for yourself. Get your career in the game by enrolling in the University of Lynchburg MBA program with an emphasis in sport management. This program opens the doors to new possibilities for a variety of careers. From being an athletic director or working in athletic administration to working for professional organizations, your favorite team to running a local parks and rec department. And employers are increasingly requesting and preferring individuals who have postgraduate education specifically looking for an MBA. And so the University of Lynchburg Sport Management concentration in the MBA program sets you up for success and it sets you apart from the many other people looking for jobs in the industry. Learn from winners. Here you will learn from professors and mentors who have spent their careers doing exactly what you want to do. Increase your marketability in an $83 billion industry. If you have a 3.0 GPA, the GMAT is waived. There's no application fee, admissions occurs on a rolling basis, and our online program is ideal for working adults. When you enroll in this program, you enroll in the opportunity to learn from the best of the best. Your professors have a wealth of experience working in the sport industry that they share with you in the classroom setting. Get in the game by getting your MBA with a sport management concentration at the University of Lynchburg. Let's see now, Hollywood, here I come. <laughs> hey, I meant, yeah. <laughs> Autographs there later. Let's
to do physical therapy and kind of one of the best um, tracks to physical therapy was exercise physiology. And Brook Hill um, is the most amazing place. Um, it's probably one of my favorite places to be. I came in working here through the Bonner program, um, just volunteering here as much as I could. And it really does incorporate um, not only like the horses that I really like, but also my major. And that kind of really sparked an interest for my thesis. I'm really studying how how the therapeutic horseback riding affects children with autism. So far, we have seen an increase in every single test that we've done, um, both the physical test and the emotional test. There's opportunities for every type of interest you could possibly have, and the professors really do care about you on an individual level. Um, it's not just a big lecture with 300 people. It's really kind of one-to-one -one learning, and I think that's really what makes it special. Hey, hey Tracy. Can I, can I photo bomb? You should. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> We're stranded. I hope someone sees this. She's fine. <laughs> Where are we going today, Tim? Monument Creek. How far? Debatable. <laughs> How do you think it's going to go? I think it's going to go well. I think we're going to have one big climb that's going to kind of suck. But then after that, we're going to have some incredible views. And it's happening. It's very mental. The worst part is when you first start, but you got to keep going and you take your breaks and you look up and you enjoy the view and it's all worth it. Hey, Mom. It's just Kate and I here. Hey, Jean. Eating some turkey? It's extra good at this spot. How's it going? Great. Well, that's what you ask every. What do you think? How's it going? What else am I going to ask? What do you think about the river, Megan? Pretty cool. Well, great answer. She called! Well, done, done. Megan, how is the open air toilet? How would you rate it on a scale of 1 to 10? Based on. I don't know. At point, I just wanted to give up. But I didn't, and I just kept pushing. Whoa! Hardcore parkour! She on X game mode. Big. When creating a sustainable future, your choices matter, even your choice of a college. The University of Lynchburg is the first college in Virginia to go carbon neutral. Our dining hall is green restaurant certified. We compost all of our food waste and purchase our electricity from landfill gas. Now we're turning a hazardous lake into a thriving urban wetland. When you choose Lynchburg, you leave a smaller footprint while building a better tomorrow. Lynchburg is all about you, your ideas, and your goals. We've got one professor for every 10 students, so you can get all the support you need. In the classroom, in the lab, or in nature. You'll learn by putting yourself out there, and we're right there with you. This is the doll. It's wicked cute. It's always so pretty. We return to Turner Gymnasium on the campus of the University of Lynchburg. Hornets trailing at the moment to the Seagulls from Salisbury, 45-38. I'm Kyle Haney. My tag team partner is the head coach of the Lynchburg women's team, Allison Nichols. We've got Sam and Andy. Andy's actually going to do double duty today. He's going to be on the call for your game, coach. So he's really putting in the work here for us, and we're having fun. Lynchburg does trail by seven. We've got our halftime statistics that we will run down. It's been an outstanding shooting day so far for Salisbury, Coach. Sometimes you just 
got to tip your cap and uh, and move on to the next one. But maybe maybe there is something Lynchburg can do as far as trying to cool down some of those Salisbury shooters. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Salisbury shooting almost 71% from the floor. You certainly don't want to see that if you're Lynchburg. But like you said, hats off to Salisbury. Whether there's there's defense out there or not, uh, you got to put the ball in the basket. So that's that's definitely impressive on their end. Was well, 26 points in the paint too for Salisbury. Um, so that could be a key there is to try to keep them out of the lane, which I think Lynchburg did a better job of that in the, in the second half of the first half. Yeah, absolutely. I think obviously they started in a little bit of a zone and kind of gave some some different looks there um, and, and gave up some, some easy points in the paint, but really seemed to lock down um, in their man-to-man -man defense late in that second half and, again, forced some outside shots, forced them to get deeper into the shot clock a little bit. So hopefully they can take that momentum, you know, into the second half and, and come out with that sort of defensive defensive intensity to start the half. Uh, what else as far as adjustments go? Or we can talk about more stats, but uh, what do you think about the, the flavor and the vibe in the locker room right now for Lynchburg? Shouldn't feel bad about where you're at, but uh, definitely – maybe a tweak here or there right sure yeah I mean I think the number one thing again they're talking about is defense you just gotta gotta force more contested shots and and keep them from shooting 70 percent from the floor I think offensively um, you know obviously going into the half with a little bit of momentum off of that three-point play uh, continuing to get downhill get that you know look to attack whether it's in transition or off some of these ball screens uh, when Pittman's in there, continue to feed him in the post. Um, I think he's their leading scorer so far in that first half. He's had some great looks, gotten himself to the free throw line. Um, so, you know, just keep that balanced offensive attack and make sure you're not just settling for jumpers. Well, I, I love getting your insight here, but uh, walk, walk the fans through how that typical halftime process works. I mean, maybe a little bit different for most teams, but uh, typically the, the, the players will go in and then you'll kind of have a chat with your assistant coaches for the first two or three minutes of that session, and then and then you go in there and talk to them, right? Yeah, I think most coaches, obviously, you give your team a little bit of time to get into the locker room, catch their breath, get settled a little bit. Uh, you know, hopefully you've got a, a good locker room environment where they can talk through some things that they're seeing on the floor and, um, you know, some things that are going well, some things that they maybe need to focus a little bit more on. And then as a coaching staff, you, you come up with, I try not to give more than about three key points um, just a couple a couple little adjustments here or there. Again, say some things that we're doing well, make sure we continue to focus on that. And then a few areas that, that we need some tweaks if we need to go over, you know, defensive uh, defensive rotation or something that's working offensively to make sure that, that we're focused on that to start that second half. When you get the stat sheet at halftime, what, what are you looking for? I mean, typically as a coach, you'd know, hey, we're getting out-rebounded or we've turned the ball over a lot. But, but do you glance at it just to see if, anything jumps out or maybe just your thoughts are confirmed by looking at it yeah I think most of the time you have a pretty good idea you know again if you're you've given up a lot of offensive rebounds or you know too many turnovers or something like that um, but sometimes something stands out you know maybe you feel like you're you're getting beat on the boards pretty bad and then you look at the stats and it's like oh we actually have you know a similar number of offensive rebounds um, or, or something along those lines. So usually there aren't a lot of big surprises on that stat sheet, but I think it is nice to have some hard hard facts for your team instead of to say, you know, hey, we need to box right. out more. You can go in and say, hey, you know, they have 11 offensive rebounds and number 12 has six of them. Right, you know, let's right. hone in on her and focus on her. So I think just to have some concrete facts to share with your team, um, you know, from some of those areas, again, that you're talking about making adjustments can really help them zero in on, on specific things. Kyle Haney hanging out. We're having some great conversations about basketball and more with the head coach of the University of Lynchburg women's team, Allison Nichols. Uh, talk about your wonderful assistant coaches. I said we were going to uh, touch on them, Jayla and Anitra. Man, uh, it's fun to watch them operate, and it looks like you give them free reign to, to really express themselves as coaches. They bring a lot of energy. I know they bring a lot of knowledge, but uh, tell the fans – a little bit more about how important they are to your ball club. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, like you said, I think I think the energy piece is always awesome. Um, you know, especially this time of year when you know, we're sometimes we're having two a days and things like that. You know, just having that constant energy in the gym is, is always a positive. 
um, and I think, in, you know, in practice as well. Um, it's nice to have different perspectives within the game, you know, during timeouts, just having them kind of share their thoughts or what they're seeing and make suggestions and, and different things like that. You know, it's nice as well having two people that played at a high level, know the game really well, you know, throughout the course of a game when you're subbing and, you know, trying to do on-court coaching, knowing that you got two people on the bench that are giving specific feedback to your players that's going to help continue to put them in a position to be successful when they go back out on the court. Well, hopefully the guys game here gets a little bit closer and we don't have a chance to talk about some of these fun things that we're getting in depth with. But uh, just uh, another another thing I wanted to definitely ask you about. If fans don't know, you went to Brookville High School just down the road here. I know you've coached at some other places. You enjoyed your time at those other places for sure. But uh, it's got to be pretty neat to, to be coaching in your hometown here at the University of Lynchburg, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I feel like I'm a, a D3 lifer. I, I tried my hand at some other levels a little bit. Uh, glad I got the experience, but I just love everything about Division Three basketball. I absolutely love the ODAC, and like you said, growing up here and having, you know, having an awesome ODAC institution like Lynchburg right in my hometown and being able to be back here and, and coaching is, is really, really special. We, uh, we have kind of been focusing a lot of our attention on Lynchburg, but we know we've got some Salisbury fans watching. We'll say hello to everybody up there, Seagull fans. Uh, what do you think from Coach Maurice Williams' perspective in the in the visitors' locker room? Got to like being up seven, but he he can't feel, and his coaching staff can't feel super comfortable about where they're at. And Lynchburg played well, as we said specifically, the last 12 minutes or so of half number one. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're Salisbury offensively, you want to keep doing what you're doing because you're shooting the ball really well. Um, you know, lots of points in the paint. Having a number of different players contribute from from that category as well. Um, so I think from that standpoint, you don't want to make a lot of adjustments. And then, you know, defensively had some really solid possessions, and then maybe a few that they they maybe want back on some late late game breakdowns. Um, but great a great hustle play by both teams right there out of uh, out of the half. But yeah, I mean, I think offensively Salisbury's got to got to feel pretty good with where they're at. Brandon Craig missed the shot, ran down his own rebound, and when he was going to the floor, you could hear it audibly, that thump. I think it was the right elbow hitting the floor, but he's up, yeah, trying to wiggle it out there. You see, great shot from our crew, getting some feeling back in the arm, and it will, basketball will stay with Salisbury. It's actually gonna be a foul on Lynchburg. It'll be the first one on Miles Taylor. Sub in the game for Brandon Craig, so he wanted to stay out there, but uh, Coach Mo Williams and uh, maybe even the training staff saying, yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's get you out and take a look here because he did hit the hardwood pretty firmly there and he'll get some attention. Uh, one thing we haven't mentioned with Salisbury coaches, they've got a female coach on the staff, Caitlin Benedict. Coach Williams told me you, you really need to meet her because she is sharp and he thinks the sky is the limit for his female coach. It's, uh, it's still pretty rare. It's rare enough still that it's worth mentioning Hopefully in the future, it's not rare and we get more women coaching men's sports, not just basketball, but uh, pretty cool stuff to have Coach Benedict over there. And uh, Coach Mar Coach Williams just talking about how he, he knows she's going to go far. He doesn't know if it's going to be as like a front office, NBA, WNBA type of situation or as a coach, but she's uh, really sharp and knowledgeable about all areas of the game. And you can see she's in that first spot over there on the bench, fans. Here comes a triple up from Bloodsworth. No good. It's run down by Elijah Davis. Davis will bring it into the front court, just left of center. Nobody going to guard him. He'll fire, and he makes it. You can't leave Elijah Davis that open too often. He will make you pay, and he does right there. Lynchburg back within six. Yeah, just dropped off a little bit there on Elijah. Unfortunately, I think it, he had his toe on the line, so only got, mm, two, right. only got two for that one, but still. Uh, you know, to see that ball go through the basket early in the half is a good sign. You're right. Good turnaround hook from Jordan Oates, but it never got to the rim. Ball is still loose. Now it's going to be Lynchburg Rock, and the Hornets trail by six. That's one of those that we were talking about earlier where maybe you'd like your team to run the offense, move it around the court, stretch the D a little bit, work the clock. But when Davis gets an open look like that, it presents itself, you really have to take it. You want guys like that taking it. You don't want to handcuff people and make them afraid to shoot. The turnaround from Pittman's no good, and it's out of bounds. 
But it's back to that feel piece. And, and a lot of that is time and score, too, isn't it, as far as, hey, you might have to pass up an open three here or there because we want to try to do something specific. Yeah, I think early in the half you're probably okay with that shot. But like you said, just depending on time and score and situations, maybe other times that might not be what you're looking for. I think sometimes some of those are, are ones where, especially if it's a shooter, you know, you shoot over 40% from the three. Yeah. You do have a green light. But sometimes as a coach, you know, you come down and they, you see a mining up and you're like, no, no, no. <laughs> right. And then it goes in and you're like, okay, okay, you will take it. You, um, so, you know, definitely, definitely good that it went in. Do you have, do you have, uh, I guess, calls, a uh, green light, yellow light, red light situation stuff, or not really that defined? Uh, not that defined. I, I think, you know, we, we hopefully do a good job in practice of, of coaching, you know, people up to what are we looking for within our offense at certain times. Uh, but I also, you know, I, I want my shooters to shoot with confidence. I want all my offensive players to play with confidence, and I don't want them – you know, freaked out about, oh, I, I can't shoot with 20, 22 seconds on the shot clock or something like that. So, you know, again, kind of back to that feel piece, just, just trying to feel out the game and knowing when to maybe take some of those quick looks and when to run the offense a little bit. Yeah, those, those constraints that sometimes coaches will use in practice where we've got to pass it seven times or everybody's got to touch it or it's got to go sideline to sideline, those are great in practice, but they, they're not really that useful in the games typically. Um, maybe with, maybe with uh, at the lower levels there is Landon Sutton gets a drive and a nice finish. Good stuff from Sutton to get inside. Sutton and Savage are typically the guys that run the point guard spot for Lynchburg coach. They both do a good job breaking down the defense and kind of just squirming their way in the lane a lot. Yeah, I mean, both of them, just really great job of attacking. And, and again, I, we like to say getting downhill. You know, you're taking that dribble towards the basket and putting pressure on that defense. And that way, you know, once you start getting downhill, you draw help side, you've got the, the dump off to a post player, or, you know, if you turn the corner, you got a free lane to the rim, nice, easy two points. Salisbury gets it in bounds. Here's Sutton trying to guard the key man, Bloodsworth. Tried to go over the shoulder with the finish, no good. Lynchburg looking to cut in the lead, they're down six. Davis lets it fly from the right wing, look good all the way, but rims off. One and done that trip, and Salisbury looking to run a little bit out front and out of bounds. Yeah, stepped out there on the right sideline. Under 17 minutes to play now in half number two. Lynchburg's been a, a better second half team lately. Uh, last five games, they're averaging 39.8 in half number two, just 33 points in half number one. I, I can't really chalk that up to anything other than Coach Hillary Scott and his great staff. They probably make good adjustments at halftime. I'm sure there's another factor or two in there, but that seems to be the one that stands out for me. Yeah, you know, sometimes teams just have trends, and there's, there's not anything specific. But, um, you know, if you're a stronger second half team and you kind of get in the groove and feel more comfortable from that standpoint, as long as you keep it close in the first half, you know, you, you come in that second half with confidence and you know you're still in it. Davis, jumper, too strong. 16, 18 left to play in half number two. Hornets down six, Bloodsworth to the lane. Nice soft touch with a teardrop over the top and here comes a timeout from Coach Hillary Scott. 16-12 left to play in the second half. Lynchburg down 8-52-44 on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. So, what are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. I thoroughly just, enjoy paddling, so we can just do that. But <laughs> I go by Tim. Most people know me as the outdoor guy. I run the outdoor leadership program. We have the pleasure of taking students in outdoor recreation trips, and we do a lot of leadership engagement. We do a lot of leadership training. I 
teach a lot. I think of myself as an outdoor educator. We do a lot of certification courses, swift water rescue, wilderness medicine. Everything we do, even the recreational trips, have a lot of education and leadership built into them as well. Now we're running, you know, It's Salisbury 52, Lynchburg 44, 612 left to play in the second half. Kyle Haney hanging out with Coach Allison Nichols. We're picking her brain as she gets ready for the Hornets women's team game tonight against Guilford. This one has really been interesting, Coach. Salisbury's led the entire time, and the Seagulls have done a great job at just keeping Lynchburg at arm's length. The Hornets will, will get closer. They'll pull close, and it seems like Salisbury, when they need a bucket or a stop or maybe both, they really deliver on time. Now they've gone to a zone defensive coverage. It looks like the Hornets gonna take some time to diagnose it. Elijah Davis will shoot over it. Lynchburg needed that. He comes into the game shooting 50% from beyond the arc. And now all of a sudden Lynchburg back within five. We'll see if Salisbury gets one of those well-placed baskets like I mentioned, not right here. Davis scrambling for the ball. Referees check with each other and it's off of Elijah Davis, so it'll stay with Salisbury. Yeah, I feel like the you know the second half has started a little bit like the first half, a yeah. little little fast paced, a little frantic. Both teams kind of trading baskets. You know, Lynchburg's now cut it to five, so it'll be interesting to see if they can continue to chip away at the lead or if uh, Salisbury can continue to keep that comfortable lead. First three of the game for Davis. He's got eight total. Hornets in their zone defense. Salisbury skip pass over the top and then watch out, open three from Bloodsworth. He's another guy that will absolutely make you pay. He shoots 42% from long distance. And right on cue, sometimes as an announcer, you get made to look good with stuff like that. I said Salisbury had gotten baskets when they needed it and they get one matching the three there. Greg Bloodsworth, impressive stuff. Here's the fade away from Pittman, can't get the roll. Nice job by Jordan Oates to take it out of the sky for Salisbury. Bloodsworth has 19, he averages 19.2 on the season. Here's a drive in by Cameron Hurd, he threw it away. Pearson Young, fast break, skips it up to Savage. Savage got pulled from behind. Coach Hillary Scott may be arguing that it might have been the intentional variety there, but I think it was enough of a play on the ball. We don't have replay today, Coach, so. Fans will just have to take our word for it if they looked away, although the officials are having a little conversation here. Maybe about that, I don't know. Yeah, I think it warrants a conversation, but I don't know that there was enough aggressive th aggressiveness there to, to call that an intentional. Now, if you're in the NBA, then I think that's a, that's a free two points right there. Yep. Because yeah. it definitely kept him from uh, that clear path to the basket. So, I mean, honestly, a smart foul there by Salisbury. Yeah. So fascinating at the different levels. It, basketball is one of those sports where each level you go, the rules are slightly different. Um, and that's just why you got to watch more hoops and get in the gym with us here at Turner. Basketball out of bounds. It's going to go to Salisbury. That was a tough one to see without replay. I don't envy the officials on that one making that call. Um, yeah, I think, I think Salisbury contemplated trying to pick that one up and take it the other way, but just a little tight on that sideline. So probably smart just to let it go on out of bounds and, and take your possession. Well, during your game Saturday, I, I talked about, because you had the situation with all the traveling violations, we were joking about that up here at halftime. Uh, as a coach, you may not keep a written file. Nice block there by Lynchburg. You may not keep a written file on each ref, but you always got kind of a mental file going on, right, as far as what, what his or her game plan might be as far as what the officials call, correct? Definitely. I, I think, you know, again, it, in our league, you, you get a little bit of everything. Um, so the ones that you see kind of regularly, you know their tendencies yeah. to maybe let them play a little bit or to call it a little bit tighter. And, you know, again, with our team, that's just – with so many freshmen just adjusting to the way the college game is called anyways is huge for them but then adjusting to the tight tightness of the travels and stuff that they never get called for at any other level it just takes a little while three from miles taylor now here's pearson young got the rebound wanted to go wall to wall there but couldn't score it there's a scramble nice job by savage 
to shield Greg Bloodsworth away from the ball, but not pick it up. That's savvy play right there from number zero, Kuda Savage. The three while we were talking from Miles Taylor. Yeah, it's, it's, can't, it's probably not one of those primary concerns for a coach, but it's definitely one of those many things that we discussed that's running through your head. Uh, some of that is when you play your five on five in, in practice, you gotta have somebody out there officiating and calling it like they're gonna call it in the, in the ODAC here, right? Definitely, I, you know, our first game of the year was at a conference, we went up to Marymount and there was, there was a ton of travels called. And so we put a, a pretty big focus on it the next couple of weeks. Again, just trying to help our freshmen and teach them a little bit of the way the college game is called. And then I think we went like four games and it wasn't called anymore. Right. And so <laughs> it's just a little bit of a hit or miss. And that just it just comes with experience from your players too, just getting a feel for things and, and how the game is gonna be called and, and knowing it can fluctuate a little bit any given night. Pearson Young didn't agree with a call there and it goes against Lynchburg, Salisbury basketball leading by five. Do you ref it in practice or you make one of your assistants do that? All three of us do and, and we actually, as we practice plan, we will talk specifically, some days we'll call it really, really tight. Yeah. And then some days, if we're really trying to work on something specific, we'll let them kind of get away with a little bit. Um, Again, that's just something trying to help them learn and adjust, but also in practice, you know, making sure we're playing a little bit and not yeah. stopping it every, every couple, you know, every possession or anything like that. Right. You, you don't want the players to see you as a, as the warden or the prison guard or anything like that. Thirteen or excuse me, twelve forty-five left to play in the game here. New man in the contest for Lynchburg is Jason Easton. His first action of the game comes here in the second half. It's Hornets basketball down by five. The intensity in the gym starting to pick up. Fouls on Cameron Hurd for Salisbury, his first. Team foul number two for the Seagulls. Lynchburg will have another one of those chances for a baseline inbound play here that the coaches love. Savage, short discussion with the official. Lynchburg with a little bit of a bigger lineup in there. Jordan Parham trying to come three, or come free for three. Instead, he'll pull up for the right elbow jumper. Got it. Big one there for Parham, and now Lynchburg back within three. Closest they've been in a long time, Coach, and you really feel the momentum swing. The volume is increasing here in Turner, and now a timeout on the court with 12.22 left to play in the game. We'll keep it right here with Salisbury leading by three. This feels kind of like that moment where Lynchburg's starting to claw back in it. So I do have to compliment Coach Williams over there. I like the timeout right there. I think he could feel the energy in the gym swinging over to the Lynchburg side as well. Definitely, I think, you know, they, they've, for his group, they were able to play a little bit of that fast pace early on, but then, uh, you know, they gave up a couple easy baskets and that closes the gap. So I don't know that he's necessarily telling them to slow it down a little bit, but like you said, get your timeout. Get your group, you know, all on the same page. You want a good offensive possession right here. Um, if you still a lot of time to play, but uh, like you said, a big a big point in the game where a basket kind of takes the momentum away a little bit. And you know, on Lynchburg's end, a stop helps you co to continue to chip away at that lead and potentially tie it up with a three. No ties, no lead changes in this one. Salisbury led the entire first half. That's quite a bit different from the game we saw your team play Saturday and also the Lynchburg guys game on Sunday. Those were, were back and forth basketball. This has been Salisbury, but again, they really just kept Lynchburg at arm's length. The Hornets have never gone away. Biggest lead was 12 at one point for Salisbury and now that has been trimmed down to three. We'll see if Lynchburg makes a defensive adjustment coming out of the timeout. I do like that from Coach Scott. He seems to seems to change up the defenses during the timeout. And then, and then even the next level thing is maybe you make it look like a zone to start when they put it in bounds, then you go to the man-to-man. -man. Those kinds of things are always nice at confusing an offense. Here comes the three from Brendan Davis and right on cue, we said Salisbury keeping them at arm's length. It's been a steady jab for the Seagulls. And now they're back up 58-52. Watch out, turnover there at midcourt. Brandon Craig has to step around a defender and he scores. So the timeout obviously working for Coach Williams. It's a quick 5-0 burst for the Seagulls. Yeah, definitely a tough five-point swing right there out of that timeout. 
Uh, but again, Lynchburg has done a great job of staying in this game. And, and there you go. You got a, a foul on a three-point shooter. And um, you know, again, this is this is someone for Lynchburg that shoots over 40% from the three-point line as well. They got a lot of weapons out there. You let somebody like that see the ball go through the basket on some free throws, and then that gets him a little bit a little bit more confidence from the perimeter. Yeah, eight of 16 coming into the game from beyond the arc. He only averages nine minutes per game, <laughs> coach. But man, he's. Uh, <laughs> Really filling that role, coming off the bench, providing a spark outside for the Lynchburg Hornets. A 6'4 freshman knocks down the first free throw. Second one, no problem as well. And Lynchburg is just pulled within six. Here comes the third with 11.44 remaining in the half. Women's team tips off at 7 p.m. So we've got a little bit of a break. It's not one of the, the double headers that, that you will do with the guys team regularly there's some time in between the games here but we hope fans will either get out to Turner in person or join us on the Lynchburg Hornets sports network it's a five point deficit now for Lynchburg zone defensive coverage guarding the basket to coach Nichols in my left the basketball gets spit out of bounds with velocity there that was like a baseball foul ball situation be careful in that seventh row up there Absolutely, that was that was a pass to athletic director John Waters up there. Good thing he was paying attention because it was coming right at him. <laughs> well, it's funny. Everybody's on their phone nowadays. It's not just the younger people. Even even us adults, we're all on our phones as well at the game. But he was probably checking the statistics just like we are. Oh, good job to get it in the middle there and a nice little pocket pass. Can't close the deal from point blank range. Craig wishes he had another crack at that. That was set up nicely by the pass from number one, Cameron Hurd. Parham for three, no go. Fight for the rebound. Now it's secured by Brandon Craig. That would have been big for Lynchburg. They'll have to wait till next possession. Quick trigger three from Oates. I'm not sure Coach Williams loved that shot early in the clock with a five point lead. Lynchburg basketball as it gets into that Salisbury bench there. 10.57 left to play in the game. 60-55, Lynchburg down five. This is Savage across the timeline on the trot. Going to use the double screen. Easton pops out. I think that was option number one, but they'll have to go through the rest of the play here. Parham cross court to Savage. Downstairs left mid post. It goes to Pittman. Couple dribbles, looking around. Needs to do something with it. He'll fade away and fire, and he nails it. Another situation there, Coach, where Pittman... Almost looked like he wanted to pass first from the post. Nobody presented themselves, so he decided to turn around and fire, and he knocks it down nicely. Lynchburg within two, or you, three, excuse me. Yeah, you definitely have to love his footwork and his patience in the post, just taking his time and taking, you know, taking what the defense gives him, not rushing anything, and um, he's had some key baskets for Lynchburg. Jordan Oates with a triple. There it is, Salisbury answers exactly when they need it. Handoff play from Savage to Young. Young, step back three on the way. No good. Rebound is loose. Parham has it. Nice dish to pitch Pittman. He'll get the defender on his back, and it was probably a pretty good move. I think that Lynchburg coaches wanted him to finish the, the basket through the contact, but pretty smart there with the pump fake. And I love the observation by you about the patience. Typically, post players get the basketball down there and the alarm clock starts going off. It comes out of their hand quick. He's he's using the full five seconds to, to look around and then uh, make sure nobody else is open before he shoots that fade away. Yeah, I think I might have to invite him to practice here this <laughs> week and get him down working with our post players. He's, he's been very impressive tonight. And actually, I think that free throw right there was the first miss by either team um, tonight on the game. I think both teams were shooting 100% up until then. I think you're right. That is miss number one. Salisbury 10 of 10. Lynchburg now 10 of 11. Pretty impressive stuff shooting-wise. I, I almost said it, that neither team had missed a free <laughs> right. throw, but I didn't want to say it for the announcer's jinx, but maybe just me thinking it put the, put the jinx on him. Well, when Macy Mullins was 5 for 5 from 3, the other night in, in your game on Saturday, the other afternoon, I should say, I, I was definitely think about it as well because it's a, it's a it's an interesting feat. You have to tell people that she's perfect from outside, but you do hesitate a little bit. It's not quite like the no hitter in baseball, but you certainly don't want to feel like you were the reason why she missed. 63-58, Lynchburg down five, zone defense again. Salisbury working it around the perimeter here. 
Seagulls looking for win number eight on the season. They are three and three in a six game road trip. This is actually game seven in that long road trip. Here's a catch and shoot three from Davis. Off the mark, ball is loose, scramble for it. Savage will finally get it on his string. Now he lost it briefly. It's up ahead into the front court. Pittman looking around. Savage whips one to number 13, Miles Taylor, who's back in there. Now it's Pittman, left high post. Here comes the turnaround, Jay. Ooh, that one woefully short and it bounces on the baseline, no good. Yeah, I think that's a possession there for Lynchburg that Coach Scott would maybe like to see. You know, you pushed it, you didn't have anything. Have your point guard go get that ball, bring it back out, get everybody set up on the same page. Just looked a little out of sorts there on that offensive possession. Lynchburg down five, 63-58. Yeah, yeah, Pittman's been really good in that, that eight, nine, ten foot range. That one was from a little bit further out. And, it may have been gassed a little bit. I mean, Pittman's been out there a long time. He's been playing hard defensively. Uh, and sometimes that, that can affect that, that feel and that touch on the shot, especially when you get further away. Don't know if you have to muscle a little bit more or not. I think the great shooters don't think about that. They just shoot and fire, but everybody is different. Nine minutes exactly left to play in the second half. See if the Hornets can Hold here and get another defensive stop. Yeah, well short on that three-pointer there from Caden Mines. Hornets want to run a little bit. No numbers, kick out three, got it, yes. Nailed it there. Jason Easton, he is a sharp shooter off that bench and he hit the bullseye from the left wing. Lynchburg within two, closest they've been since the start of the contest. Yeah, again, Easton's given them some great minutes this half. Like we said, I mean, a 50% three-point shooter, but the, you know, his first baskets were free throws, and so he got to see the ball go through the basket a little bit, and now he's shooting it with confidence. Six total. Shot clock down to three, a drive, and made it there. Buddha Spencer levitating through the lane. That was very helpful for Salisbury. Again, another answer right when they need it. Show and go from Savage, then he gets cuts off. Cut off, now he'll work some post moves. Over to Parham, Parham went up, lost the handle on the way up. Ball is loose, Buddha Savage, one hand bounce pass through traffic up to Mines, he'll cycle it through, finds Craig. Nice job on the ball movement there from Salisbury. It was going everywhere, they had to use the one hand pass, the wrap around, it was all sorts of fun stuff on display and there is a foul on the floor. The foul is on Kuda Savage. It is team foul number five. It stops the clock with 7.53 left to play. Salisbury holding on to the four-point lead. Brandon Craig will shoot two. Yeah, I mean, good decision there, I think, by Salisbury. You know, potentially had something there in transition, but would have been a contested layup. Just kind of brought it out, let your teammates enter the play, and then you get something going to the rim and you get to the free throw line. So definitely a smart, smart play on that end. Um, again, Lynchburg's hanging around. They, they keep cutting that lead but they just can't get those stops quite yet when they need them. Um, but still, plenty of game left to play. 7.53 left, in fact. It's a four-point lead for Salisbury. These teams first met in the 80-81 season. Last time they played Lynchburg, won close, 77-75. Hornets are four and two all-time in the series. That's a fun one for the announcers to look at the all-time records, Coach, but I – it's one of those that has no implication on the games. You know, nobody out there is saying, oh, we want to we want to revenge that loss in 80. You know, it's um, but it is something to fill some time. And uh, who knows? Maybe we have some alumni from both schools watching who remember some of those games from before. Landon Sutton's back in there for Lynchburg. Savage is out. They're kind of interchangeable at that point guard spot. I think we've seen Satin and Savage and Sutton play together just a little bit. She certainly got some three-point shooting out there, really from all five at the moment for Lynchburg. Not that they're going to settle for the three, but all these players capable. Taylor will bring it in and then send it to the top of the key to Pittman. Now it's Sutton. He is going to use the screen. Thought he might refuse it at first. Jason Easton, the sharpshooter, had it on its hip for a moment. Inside, banging and bruising. Pittman can't finish from the left side. That's a good offensive possession there for Lynchburg, though. You ran your stuff, you set a couple screens, ball switched sides of the floor, penetrated the paint. Uh, and, and honestly, I mean, again, great offensive possession and then just good defense from Salisbury's part not to break down and to give up an easy look. Another three-point shooter walking to the table, ready to come in. That's Elijah Davis. 
He can score in a variety of ways, but definitely very dangerous from long distance. Clock down to two, ball got out of his hand in time. Brandon Craig with another one. Impressive stuff there from Craig. He's got 21. Oh, he's nearly had a steal there as a basketball out of bounds. It may be Salisbury possession anyway. It's a foul, it's a foul on number 32, Jason Easton for Lynchburg. 6.51 remaining in the game. The lead back up to seven for Salisbury, feeling a little bit more comfortable. If you're Lynchburg, now is the time when you gotta be careful. You don't wanna fall down double digits this late in the game. Not impossible to come back, but certainly the odds are not in your favor. Yeah, you can definitely tell some of the experience that Salisbury has, you know, with, with Craig, a, a fifth year guy that's averaging double digits. It's kind of like you have some people like that on your team and you know when you need a basket, they can step up and get that basket. Yeah, the two fifth year seniors, Brandon Craig and Greg Bloodsworth, they are combining for 40 right now. Craig with 21, Bloodsworth 19. And to your point, it's been so much more than that, controlling the basketball, really being the stalwarts, the anchors on defense. What a steal there by Miles Taylor to anticipate and jump in front. Parham cleared for takeoff. Looked like he wanted the dunk. He'll set her full, settle for an easy two, though, and Lynchburg's back within five, 68-63. Nice play by Taylor. Great read there defensively to sneak in and grab that pass. Nice burst, too. Didn't take him long to get going. Lynchburg defending the basket to our left. Inside to Sean Carr, who hasn't played a whole lot. Might be his first action. Wow, how about that play? Angling in and skying off the window there for Davis. That is a tough angle to shoot off the backboard there. Nice touch to get it to go. I think he had to hit it above the square on the glass to make it count in the lead back up to seven. Moisture on the court. There's multiple players pointing out areas and conversations with officials going on. Oh wow, we we had a uh, we had a technical foul situation there, Coach. Do we know who uh, was I, it called on? Well, Coach Scott or someone on the floor? Our public address man today is a guy you and I both know so well, Bob Alvis. He was announcing it there. Coach Scott's having a pretty in-depth conversation with one of the officials. We'll we'll see if we can tie up the loose ends and figure it out. But the one shot foul there is good. So now it's an eight point lead for Salisbury. This is again, that danger zone that we've mentioned a couple times. Gotta be careful with under six to play. You know what that, that may have been in the men's game now, you get a technical for flopping. Yeah. And so they may have actually, cause it was just a one shot yep. technical. So I think that must've been exactly what the call was. Uh, they called Lynchburg for a flop but it was kind of simultaneous with the basket, so they still gave them the basket and then called that technical. So that's a, that's a tough call. Hornets in need of a basket here with 5.50 left to play in the game. Sutton will pull up from the free throw stripe, no good from 15. Now the Hornets need to hustle back and play defense again, expect these possessions to be a bit longer for the Seagulls, a team that has some veterans. It's a nice mix of old and young. And good ball movement here to get it in the corner for three. No good, that one tapped out of bounds by Jordan Oates who is trying to lean over the box out to reel it in for Salisbury. Pearson Young's back in there for Lynchburg. Hornets are down eight, 71-63. How much does your game plan change now, coach, when you are down eight, you know time is running out. Uh, the, how much do you adjust? How much can you adjust on the fly? There's some things that you just can't really do in the game, right? Yeah, I think right now you still don't hit that panic button. I mean, five and a half minutes is a long time. You've still got one more media timeout. You got a couple timeouts in your pocket, but you got to get stops defensively and then make sure that you're having good offensive possessions. I thought Salisbury would run some more time off that shot clock in the last possession. They did not. They don't need to here as well with a nice dish inside to Sean Carr. He was waiting patiently in the low post for that one. Here's a cut from Miles Taylor. Had to change the finish there on the double clutch and it will not go. It's a Salisbury 10 point advantage. Oates, three, nailed it, wow. Probably goes against the textbook there, but when it goes in, it's a good shot. Jordan Oates knocks it down, timeout on the court. Salisbury 76, 
And Lynchburg 63 with 4.43 left to play in the contest. It's a full one minute timeout. We'll step aside for a brief break here on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network. My name is Alexis Fabula. I major in criminology and I double minor in psychology and criminal forensics. My favorite part about Lynchburg is the friends that I've um, come to have. It's helped me come out of my shell more and it's helped me become the person I am and the student I am. I really enjoyed how small the campus was and I also really enjoy um, how small the class sizes are. It made me feel like I was going to be more engaged than I would at a bigger campus. If someone was on the fence of coming to the University of Lynchburg, I would definitely love to sit down and have a conversation with them because I'm forever grateful that I made this choice. Um, it's definitely something that a student wouldn't regret. I, out of my four years here, I've not had one bad experience. I've had a great four years and I'm going to be very sad to go. Salisbury shot it well in the first half. They continue to shoot it well. They are 42% from beyond the three-point line. That's 8 of 19, just a little bit above 42% coach. And wow, 57% from the field. So when you look back at this one, if you're Lynchburg, you're going to see those numbers. And you may say, well, we couldn't do anything. They just shot the lights out. And that is part of the story here today. The Seagulls really making it rain from all areas of the court. First half, we thought they were getting some great looks inside. Second half, they've shot it well from everywhere. Yeah, you know, it's crazy to say maybe they've cooled off a little bit. They right. shot over 70% in the first half, and now they're, they're, they're down to 57%. But, yeah, I mean, they, they've taken advantage of, of open shots for sure. Parham pulls up from outside the left edge of the lane, and that's no good. Certainly got to give Salisbury credit in the other areas, too. It's not, uh, it hasn't been a fluke. They're going to lose the basketball here. Maybe Lynchburg can cut into the deficit down 13. Parham will hang and score from the right side. Yeah, Hornets needed that. 76, 65, Salisbury by 11. Subs waiting to come in for Lynchburg here. The Seagulls have been pretty good defensively. They've been really good on the glass. And overall, it's been a nice performance for Coach Maurice Williams' squad. We'll see if they can finish it off. Another three-pointer, no good. That was Bloodsworth. And now Lynchburg with a chance to make the deficit single digits. Pump from Parham, thinking about using the screen from Davis. Instead, over to Landon Sutton. They swing it around the horn. Young will drive, jump pass. Davis got handcuffed, got the bracelets on him. He was able to get the basketball out, not in, but two free throws coming up for Elijah Davis. And now it's cliche, Coach, but free throws are going to become very important for both squads. If you're Salisbury, you know you're going to have to make some down the stretch. If you're Lynchburg, got to score without the clock moving. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's good back-to-back -back possessions there for Lynchburg. You know, you forced a corner three. You were able to get the defensive rebound. Came down, got a good offensive possession. Again, attacked that paint, got something right under the rim. And like you said, I mean, if they could score without that clock moving, then they can continue to extend this game a little bit. Davis with a rare miss. The 6'4 sophomore from Chapel Hill will get another shot. I guess we haven't talked about his uh, talented coaching father at all, but uh, maybe we'll get into that here. He does knock down one of two. Elijah Davis, the son of Hubert Davis. He was in the building on Sunday to watch the Lynchburg men play. That's got to be tough as a coach when you see him in the gym to not run over there and start asking him a billion questions, right? You want to be respectful of a guy that's just here to watch his kid. But on the other hand, you're talking about a Division I coach here and, not, and, and a great player in his own right back in the day. Absolutely. I remember the first time I saw him on campus, I was actually sitting in my office, and I just heard voices in the hallway. And I look <laughs> up, and he's literally standing in my doorway and said, hello, coach. And I, right. you know, I just looked up and said, hey. And then I'm like, oh, my gosh, right. that's Hubert Davis. Wow. Um, so yeah, awesome, awesome to have Elijah here and for him to be able to, to come to campus and catch some games as well. 
Brandon Craig makes another one, just what the doctor ordered for Salisbury, more of the same. They're able to answer when they need it, able to get some stops when they need it. There's a missed shot from Lynchburg now, with two and a half left to play. The Hornets are gonna have to be really special. It's gonna have to be A-plus basketball from Lynchburg from here on out. There's a signal from Greg Bloodsworth, puts the palm to the ground, tells his guys to settle down, let's run some clock there. A little bit of a late whistle, but I think probably the right call. Savage with the slap there on the wrist. That is his second. It's Lynchburg seventh as a team, so now it's shooting from here on out. This will be number one, Cameron Hurd. Yeah, I think some people forget that uh, Hubert Davis still holds a couple records for some NBA franchises as far as his shooting prowess. So uh, you can definitely get some tips there on the shooting form. And what a great run North Carolina had last year. It got hot. I know Tar Heel fans are pressing the panic button now. But remember, it was, a, it was a really good last month and a half for North Carolina last year. It's still relatively early in basketball season. Three-pointer up from Young. That got partially blocked. Mm. Major collision as he went to get it back. He'll scramble to his feet with 2.05 left to play in the game. Salisbury up 79-66. I mean, how do you think about this season? Do you break it up week by week? Do you wait till Christmas to really start analyzing a whole lot? Or is it just kind of a, you don't even think in those terms, really? Well, I think you do think in those terms. And, you know, we talked a lot with our young team about, you know, this truly is, it's a little bit cliche, but it's a marathon. It is yeah. not a sprint. And, and ultimately, you want to be playing your best basketball in February. And, you know, with us being so young, we know that we're going to continue to learn and grow throughout the season. And what we put on the floor in February is going to look completely different than what we look like in November, whereas some more seasoned teams may look about the same. And, and we hope certainly that that's an advantage to us. But, you know, sometimes it's a little bit of luck, too. you got to be healthy down the stretch. Um, and, again, you just kind of want to be firing on all cylinders when you're getting towards the end of league play and then going into tournament time. Well, and the great thing with those talented freshmen is they, they come in as – as just that talented freshman with potential. But if you've played 20 minutes a game, you might have 400 minutes under your belt by the time you get to, to tournament season. You hope everybody's healthy like that. Three pointer good from Trey Pittman. He nails that one. Lynchburg needed that. Not a whole lot of life left for the Hornets here. I shouldn't say that they have life. They're still playing hard, but the chances of winning the game are starting to slip away for Lynchburg as they trail 82, 69, 51.4 seconds left. Let's just keep it right here and get your thoughts on this situation because this is this happens a lot in a basketball game. You've been fighting, you've been close, and then all of a sudden the other team starts to pull away, and now you got to play this last minute or two. How hard are you thinking about the comeback? How much are you preaching, hey, let's just – Let's play smart basketball. Let's let's see the things we always like to see, and maybe we get lucky and hit another three or two, and then we'll and then we'll go from there. But what's the what's the thought process right now for Coach Hillary Scott, at least in your opinion? Well, obviously, again, still early January. This is a non-conference game. You know, use this for some coaching points. So I would assume Lynchburg is going to come out with some full court pressure. Maybe try to trap, be super aggressive. Attack those passing lanes. You know, like you said, if you get a steal, you get a quick three. Just continue to try to extend this game a little bit. Uh, but, again, use this situation as something that, that you may need, you know, a week from now, a month from now, something like that, as you dive into, you know, deep into league play. Hornets men's team will be on the road next game, fans. They go up to Bridgewater Saturday. Eagles are 5-6 and six on the season, 0-2 oh in ODAC play. I think Bridgewater's actually got – an ODAC game tonight. Uh, yeah, they're playing tonight, and it will be an interesting contest there when Lynchburg goes on the road. Your team is at home Saturday. I know you're not looking ahead from tonight, fans, if you joined us late. The women's team will be in action against Guilford. And then you guys are back here again Saturday, so it's a good stretch of home games to see some basketball at Turner Gymnasium. And the women's team would love your support. Great fan support all year. It's always nice to play at home as Savage commits a foul from behind the back of Brendan Davis. But uh, talk about playing in this gym, the support you get. I know the winter break here, so this amount of students aren't around. But, uh, you know, even this weekend, it was, a, it was a nice crowd out here for New Year's Eve when people have plenty of other things they could be doing still showed up. 
Yeah, I think that's one thing that is a little difficult with, with you know, being that winter sport. You essentially play almost half of your season when school's not in session. Yeah. So you don't always get to play in front of, you know, your students and, and that sort of crowd. But I think we're lucky that there's a, a good bit of community support here in Lynchburg. And I know for our team, I mean, our, our, the families of our, our players are awesome. And they do a great job of getting to games and traveling and being here to support their, their daughters and support the team. And, and we certainly appreciate having them in the stands. Savage for three, looked good, couldn't go. Pearson Young, offensive rebound, also can't close the deal from point blank range. And now we're under 30 seconds to play in a game that Salisbury is going to win. It's just a question of by how much. Yeah, no need to worry about the shot clock here. They'll run it out. And there is a slight differential, but it's really not going to matter. Salisbury is going to move to eight and six on the season. They cap off a long road trip four and three. They'll be excited to play in front of their home crowd Saturday. For Lynchburg, they fall to four and nine on the year. And as we mentioned, next in action Saturday on the road against Bridgewater. So we'll start to put the finishing touches on this one. Yeah, the shot clock ran out, so Lynchburg will get it in. Parham not even going to try a buzzer beater in the final horn sounds from Turner. But it's just game one today. The Women's team in action against Guilford. Coach, this was a lot of fun. I hope we get to do it again. You told me that you had done this before, but um, I think you undersold how, how good you were going to be doing this, and I hope the fans really enjoyed it. I know I did. I could just pick your brain about basketball all all day. We didn't even get into the nuances of the bounce pass and all, <laughs> those, all those fun things. I mean, it, I'm, it, it was a good time. Yeah, I, you know, I think most coaches are, but I am a basketball junkie and I certainly love watching it and at, at all different levels. And, you know, I really enjoy doing this and obviously don't have the opportunity to do it often because a lot of times, uh, you know, we're at home and the guys are on the road, but um, hopefully there will be some other opportunities down the road for sure. Real quick thought to pick your brain again, though, just in regards to this one. Lynchburg Falls 83-69. Uh, we've talked about you're trying to peak at tournament time. You've got uh, not as young a team as you do on the women's side, but the men have a young team, inexperienced. Uh, this isn't a game where you're going to go into that post-game locker room and read them the riot act or, or peel paint off the walls, right? Coach Scott's going to try to take some positives away from this one and uh, and hopefully improve. But what? how do you brand that message when you get in the locker room after a game like this where, yeah, you're disappointed, but you're also thinking big picture too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, non-conference game, all games matter, and we want to win every game. But essentially, your non-conference schedule is trying to prepare you for ODAC play. And I know Coach Scott and I both have, have talked a lot. We both really challenged our teams in the non-conference, and we played really difficult teams. We played Both of us played multiple teams that are in the top 25 right now. And, and your hope is those sort of games and that sort of competition is helping to prepare your teams for anything that they may see uh, come conference time. So, again, with this, you know, they've got a big conference game at Bridgewater coming up on Saturday. So, you know, these last two games, although you would like to see two wins, you know, if there's some things that you can build off of from uh, the William Peace game and this game as well, you kind of take that and you got a couple days of practice and then you're ready to go take on Bridgewater on Saturday. We'll close it up there, fans. You've been listening to Lynchburg women's coach, Allison Nichols. We'll let you run, coach. Get your team ready for a game tonight, 7 p.m. tip between Lynchburg and Guilford. Hopefully you can make it out to the gym and see it in person. If not, we got you covered. Andy will be on the call here in just a bit for the women's contest. Looking forward to that one. We'll say so long here from Wayne Prophet Court. It was Salisbury 83, Lynchburg 69. Seagulls get win number eight on the season. Lynchburg falls to four and nine. We appreciate you tuning in on the Lynchburg Hornets Sports Network.